Well, hey, BookTube, welcome back to the History Shelf. I am Peg, your host, and today we have a new History on the Horizon episode. I believe it's number seven. Um, and just funny, just seconds before I started this video, I'm trying to organize my stacks because I don't know where to begin. <laughs> I've got quite a lot of new books here. Uh, publishers have been sending um, me some great titles and um, I'm reviewing several of these currently. And so it's a mixture of finished copies, um, galleys, things like this, but I thought I would share them with you as always as I do on this channel to um, put these books on your radar. So you can uh, kind of put together your reading lists for spring, summer, um, and fall. Well, we're not getting to fall yet, but you know, you know what I'm saying. All right, so what should we do? Let's change it up. Usually on these videos, I will show you uh, the finished copies or the books that are out now, and then I'll move into books that are yet to come. But this time around, let's start with the books that uh, have not been published yet, because I think that's what you're really interested in knowing what's coming, right? Right. That's what I'm telling myself. Um, well, so let's start with this for you fans of World War II history, um, especially any fans of uh, the movie and the book Unbroken. I think it's by Lauren Hildebrand or Hillebrand. Um, I got this in galley form. This is coming out in May, May 16th. Uh, the publisher is uh, Dutton Caliber. It's Caliber Books, and uh, I got a big fat. Galley. <laughs> this is Lost at Sea. Uh, Eddie Rickenbacker's Eddie Rickenbacker's 24 Days Adrift on the Pacific, a World War II tale of courage and faith by John Lukovitz. Uh, Lukovitz. So it's kind of in galley right now, uh, so I don't even have a pub sheet. But as we get closer, um, I will have that, and I can read more to you about it, but I think if you're familiar with the tale from Unbroken, his plane was shot down and uh, he was uh, had to survive at sea. And oh, I love tales like this. So I'm really looking forward to this. I won't be reading this right away because it's May 16th. I had to jot it down here for myself. But I hope to hit this by late April. And hopefully I'll have a finished copy in hand that I can show you guys. So that's coming. A book that I'm reading right now at this very moment. Uh, I'll be reviewing it this weekend. Writing a, a written review for Shelf Awareness. Uh, and boy, am I just zipping through it. I'm really enjoying this so far. This is There Will Be Fire. Margaret Thatcher, The IRA, In Two Minutes That Changed History by Rory Carroll. This is coming out from Putnam Books. This is the advanced copy, so uh, I'm assuming this is the final cover. Um, it's coming out April 4th, so that's coming up sooner than the other book. Um, so in, in case you're not aware of this, it's, you know, in 1984, uh, the IRA did try to kill Margaret Thatcher. Yeah, a lot of you are wondering where Martine is during this commentary. No, we're not going <laughs> to subject her or you or me to, to that. But uh, yeah, I, you know, Ireland does not care for Margaret Thatcher, and they never did, and uh, so there's a lot of enmity there. But anyway, let's get into what this one's about. Uh, a bomb planted by the Irish, well, Irish Republican Army, that's IRA, right? Okay. Um, a bomb planted by the IRA exploded at 2.54 a.m. on October 12, 1984. It was the last day of the Conservative Party conference at the Grand Hotel in the coast coastal town of Brighton, England. Rooms were obliterated, dozens of people wounded, five killed. Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher was in her suite when the explosion occurred. Had she been just a few feet in another direction, flying tiles and masonry would have sliced her to ribbons. As it was, she survived and history changed. There Will Be Fire is the gripping story of how the IRA came astonishingly close to killing Thatcher in the most spectacular attack ever linked to the Northern Ireland Troubles. Journalist Rory Carroll reveals the long fight for Irish freedom that led to Brighton, the hide-and-seek between the IRA and British security services, the planting of the bomb itself, and the painstaking search for clues and suspects afterwards. Carroll draws on his own interviews and original reporting, and he reveals new information and weaves together previously unconnected threads. 
There Will Be Fire is a journalistic nonfiction that reads like a thriller. And it really does. Um, uh, propelled by a countdown to detonation. It, it does read like a thriller. I was up late, <laughs> again, reading. Um, uh, it kind of follows one of the uh, bomb makers for the IRA. And the part where I'm at now, uh, switching the viewpoint over to um, a ruck. Um, that drives me crazy that I can't remember. That was the constabulary within Ireland. If uh, Martine was here, she would tell me uh, exactly what that means. But RUC stands for um, the Royal Ulster Constabulary. So I at least I had the constabulary correct. Um, so those were the policemen in Northern Ireland. And so they're taking the, the viewpoint of the guys on the other side of the IRA. So um, it's reading fantastic. I, when I'm done with this video, um, I'll be reading it this afternoon. I work only on half days on Friday, so I have the afternoon right now f to myself that I make a video, and I'm going to continue reading this. It's fantastic. <laughs> so far. All right, next book. Coming up, another book that I will be reviewing um, for Shelf Awareness. Now, this book comes out April 18th. So April 18th, mark your calendars for Queens of a, Queens of a Fallen World, uh, The Lost Women of Augustine's Confessions by Kate Cooper. This is put out by Basic Books. Um, so April 18th, right? And uh, it's not, not too big of a book. I definitely should be able to breeze through this one in a, in a day or two. Um, so what do we know about this book? While many know of St. Augustine and his confessions, few realize how profoundly his life and thought were influenced by women. Queens of a Fallen World tells a story of betrayal, love, and ambition, and the ancient world is seen through women's eyes. Historian Kate Cooper introduces us to four women who collided in Augustine's early adulthood. Monica, his mother. Uh, whoa, there's some punctuation <laughs> that makes it... I'm just going to read what it says. Okay. Monica, comma, his lover. Sorry. Monica, his mother, semicolon, his lover, semicolon, his fiance, semicolon, and Justina, comma, empress of ancient Rome. Oh. Unless the lover and the fiance just don't have names in this book. Okay. Anyway. Um, Though they came from different walks of life, each found her own way of prevailing in a world, world ruled by men. Drawing upon their depictions in the Confessions, Cooper skillfully reconstructs their lives and restores their influence to Augustine's legacy. A moving and intimate narrative history, Queens of a Fallen World is the riveting story of four remarkable women who set Augustine on course to change history. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, yeah. So there are four women. Um, <laughs> and Monica, his mother, was not his lover and his fiance. Okay. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah, the other names in here are Tacita. Tacita and Una. Okay, it's just not in the, the, the back copy. Um, so, it sounds good. Again, April 18th, Queens of a Fallen World. Uh, just another different look at St. Augustine and his life and how he was influenced. Ooh, now this book. I am... Uh, oh, shoot. Okay, no, this is, this is a finished copy that I have, but I'm going to be highlighting it probably for the next um, um, Historathon... 2023 selections for our next section of readings that take you from 500 to 1500. So I'm saving this next one. Okay. Uh, so, but books that have not been published yet. This one looks really fantastic and I can't wait to get into this. This is also, this is coming out April 4th um, along with uh, There Will Be Fire. But this one is from Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. This is The Wounded World. W.E.B. Du Bois and the First World War by Chad L. Williams. So I've got an advanced copy here, but it's going to be a chunkster. It's about 500 pages. I'll hold this up for you guys. Sorry for the glare. Uh, in the Wounded World, Chad Williams tells the fascinating story of a long gestating but never completed book project that Du Bois wrestled with for much of his life beginning in the late 1910s and continuing for more than two decades. 
As the U.S. entered the First World War, Du Bois used his platform as editor of the crisis to call on black Americans to close ranks with the U.S. and support the country's war efforts. Following armistice, Du Bois traveled to Europe and to meet with soldiers and gather research materials with the goal of ultimately writing the definitive history of African Americans' experience in the war. But as his perspective and worldview shifted over the years and decades, Du Bois came to regret his initial support of the war effort, and consequently the scope and focus of his perspective World War I book dramatically expanded and evolved. Um, it says here, The uh, Wounded World is a vivid, poignant biography of Du Bois in the second half of his life and an impressive work of scholarship, but it's much more than that. And then it gives a blurb uh, by another writer, um, and people are calling it a masterpiece. So, yeah, looking forward to this one, um, and, and to getting a finished copy, because uh, there's going to be, I'm sure, a lot of um, additional information. Uh, the index is not in this, so I would like to have an index so I can easily... Uh, resort to this and have easy, you know, reference material or, or finding the reference material without an index, it's, it's really hard, but, um, and of course photos. Um, I love, I love photos, so, and these are not in the advanced reader copies, but April 4th, The Wounded World by Chad Williams, out by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. Okay, I think I think that does it for my galleys. I've been reading a few things on e-reader as well, <clears throat> which I've already finished. Uh, one was fiction, one was not. Just finished a book called V is for Victory. Let me tell you about that. Sorry, I don't have my e-reader to show you the picture, uh, but it was a big book. <laughs> wow. It was a big book. Um, and I feel like I should have gotten paid a little bit more for that written review because <laughs> it just was a lot of reading. Um, but that's okay, you know. Um, it's about 500 pages, um, but it was dense, um, but really good. And it comes out May 23rd. I hope to get a final copy uh, and then I can show it to you on the channel. But V is for Victory, Franklin Roosevelt's uh, American Revolution and the Triumph of World War II. Um, by Craig Nelson. I'm sure many of you have heard of Craig Nelson. I have as well. I have a couple of his other of his books. But it comes out May 23rd from Scribner. Um, and uh, it was really it was really good. It's 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 bound to be a masterpiece of source, uh, sorts. I'm sure. Um, kind of going into the industrial capabilities of America and how FDR kind of just uh, through the New Deal and um, the things that his administration and his uh, his managers uh, in, at the cabinet level and below kind of learned. Um, they learned how to work on big projects that required a big funding, and they figured out a way through new deal the, the, through the New Deal policies. Basically, Nelson's kind of premising that that was a trial run for preparing the nation for war in World War II, and how we had to ramp up. Uh, just everything. Our, our military was 17th in the world. After World War I, all the drawdowns and all the, the, the budgets were just cut for military and people just had enough, right? When they had no plans of going into another world war. Um, so, and Roosevelt knew before, before the J Japanese attack that we would have to support in some way, shape, or fashion our allies. Um, and that required massive amounts of, of war material production. So really cool to to read about how the um, oh the, the the capitalists you know and the businessmen the industrialists um, had to they 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 called them one dollar a year men right because they were so they were barons they were so rich that um, yeah their salary for working with the government to to put aside domestic production and to ramp up uh, producing for war like tanks airplanes ships. Uh, Anything, anything, machine tools, anything to help with uh, rearming not only our military but sending stuff overseas to Britain um, was just uh, paramount. So, a fascinating look. I think you guys will like it, but it was a big book. It was a big read. <laughs> uh, again, keep an eye out for V is for Victory. Um, that's coming out May 23rd by Scribner. I was just looking at my screen to help me with that. Okay. 
now ah! okay so the next book this is a little book um, this is it's available right now it's put out by a little press called Nicasio Press um, I'm reviewing this at the end of the month for book trip and this is message in a matchbox Mem memories of a childhood in Tehran by Sarah Fashandi uh, it's just a little memoir and um, you know, I, as you know on this channel, I, I do like memoirs of all different kinds, not just military memoir. It says here, it all started during our family reunion in the summer of 2006 when I discovered an invaluable treasure, my oldest brother's memories of growing up. His name is Moshin, or Mosin, and he was born in Tehran, Iran, to poor struggling young parents. As early as age six, he figured out how to be creative and make money to fill his empty stomach. As he related his memories to me, I understood what had made him the fascinating, jovial, and hardworking man he has become. He has always had a calm confidence about him, as if he felt no need to impress anyone. He didn't have to. He had been through so much that by the time he was 23, he had lived a fuller life than most people ever experience. Um, these stories are selections from Mosin's many memories, including his clever scheme to make money from a trench near his dad's shop an incubator he built to grow chickens and keep his family from starvation and the burden of guilt from losing a brother. Um, the most important goal, he says his mother's constant encouragement motivated him to move forward and eventually go to the U.S. to the United States for a higher education. The most important goal she had for all of her children was to obtain a higher education and live better lives. So it's a little memoir and I, I like to support little independent presses like this and, and kind of bubble up these type of stories. I really, that's really nice hand drawing there. So, me Message in a Matchbox by Sarah Fashandi, Nakajio Press. That's out now. Okay, moving on into a book I'm super excited for. It's Women, it's March, it's March, it's March. Oh my God, I need to slow down. March has so many events in book two. We've got March of the Mammoths. We've got March Mystery Madness. We've got, uh, what else is there? Well. You know, March is Women's History Month, right? So, this book kind of lends itself both. And then we have Historathon 2023 continuing um, in April, right? We're going through April, May, June to, to cover the years 500 to 1500 AD. And I think this will fit in very nicely in the Middle Ages. Um, and Women's History, this is a new book out by uh, Janina Ramirez. And it's called Femina, A New History of the Middle Ages through the women written out of it. Isn't that fascinating? This is put out by Hanover, Hanover Square Press. Uh, it's out right now, I believe. It's, um, I, well, I've got a finished copy, so it's very close to publication or it's already out. Um, so it says here, the Middle Ages are seen as a bloodthirsty time of Vikings, saints and kings, a patriarchal society that oppressed and excluded women. But when we dig a little deeper into the truth, we can see that the Dark Ages were anything but. And most of us already know that. Um, there's been a, a huge corrective to that story. Oh, this has been ongoing for the last 10 years or so. So, uh, Oxford and BBC historian Janina Ramirez has uncovered countless influential women's names struck out of historical records, with the word Femina annotated beside them. As gatekeepers of the past ordered books to be burned, artworks to be to destroyed, and new versions of myths, legends, and historical documents to be produced, our view of history has been manipulated. Only now, through a careful examination of the artifacts, writings, and possessions they left behind, are the influential and multifaceted lives of women emerging. Femina goes beyond the official records to uncover the true impact of women, such as Jadwiga, the only female king in Europe, Marjorie Kemp, who exploited her image and story to ensure her notoriety. Loftus Princess, whose existence gives us clues about the beginnings of Christianity in England. Um, in Femina, Ramirez invites us to see the medieval world with fresh eyes and discover why these remarkable women were removed from our collective memories. Uh, and here's our author. It's not focusing. <laughs> um, but it's just full of uh, illustrations. Um, this is going to be fantastic. I think this is going to be one of my uh, reads for um, 
the second quarter of Historathon 2023. And it's good to start it now in Women's History Month. Femina, Hanover Square, Hanover Square Press Books. And this is by, again, Janina Ramirez. Yay! So many good things out, guys. So many great things out there. How are you guys doing? Let's just take a little break from it. Take a little sip of something here. <sighs> it's been a couple weeks, hasn't it? I had planned on having more um, videos made. Stay tuned um, if you are still watching. <laughs> we will have the wrap up for the Miss Marple. Uh, Marple a month wrap up video for A Murder is Announced should be coming oh, right behind this video. So you won't have to wait long. All right, the next book is, um, the publishing date is March 7th. I already have a finished copy. I'm so stoked. Um, this is The House of Dudley, okay? Uh, a New History of Tudor England by Joanne Paul. So I'm going to hold up this beautiful cover. It's a beautiful cover for you guys. While I read what this is about. It says here, uh... Each Tudor, each Tudor monarch made their name with a Dudley by their side, or by crushing one beneath their feet. The Dudleys thrived at the court of Henry VII, but were sacrificed to the popularity of Henry VIII. Rising to prominence in the reign of Edward VII, the Dudleys lost it all by advancing Jane Grey to the throne over Mary I. That was until the reign of Elizabeth I, when the family was once again at the center of power and would do anything to remain there. With three generations of felled favorites, what was it that caused this family to keep rising so high and falling so low? Here for the first time is the story of England's Borgias, a noble house competing in a murderous game for the English throne. Witness cunning, adultery, and sheer audacity from history's most brilliant, bold, and deceitful family. Joanne Paul welcomes you to the house of Dudley. Yes! Uh, this is going to be fun. Um, nice big book. Gonna be a nice juicy read. This is put out by Pegasus Books. Ask for it at your library. I'm sure they're gonna have it. Um, so it's out later this week. I get well next uh, next Monday. Yeah, next Monday. House of Dudley, guys. Woo! What else do we have? Oh, another book releasing on March seventh. And I'm also really stoked to read this. This is, uh, I've got an advanced reader copy of that. This is put out by the New Press. And this is called Deadly Quiet City. True Stories from Wuhan by Murong Shukun. I hope that's correct. Very stark cover. Very, very uh, antiseptic, you know, as it would be for this topic. Deadly Quiet City. This is coming out. Oh, and yeah, I already said the New Press is the publisher. It says here, from one of China's most celebrated and now silenced literary authors, riveting portraits of eight Wuhan residents at the dawn of the pandemic. When a strange new virus appeared in the largest city in central China late in 2019, the 11 million people living there were oblivious to what was about to hit them. But rumors of a new disease soon began to spread, mostly from doctors. In no time, lines of sick people were forming at the hospitals. At first, the authorities downplayed medical concerns, then they locked down the entire city and confined people to their homes. From Beijing, Muran Shikun, one of China's most popular writers, silenced by the regime in 2013 for, her, for his outspoken books in New York Times articles, followed the state media fearing the worst. Then on April 6, 2020, he made his way quietly to Wuhan, determined to look behind the heroic images of sacrifice and victory propagated by the regime to expose the fear, confusion, and suffering of the real people living through the world's first and harshest COVID-19 lockdown. In the, in the tradition of Dan Baum's best-selling Nine Lives, Deadly Quiet City focuses on the remarkable stories of eight people in Wuhan. They include a doctor at the front line, a small businessman separated from his family, a volunteer who threw himself into assisting the sick and dying, and a party loyalist who found a reason for everything. Although the Chinese Communist Party has devoted enormous efforts to rewriting the history of the pandemic's outbreak in Wuhan, these poignant and beautifully written first-hand accounts tell us what really happened in Wuhan, giving us a book unlike any other on the earliest days in the pandemic. 
So another a really important addition is we continue to write history of recent history, history that we're still living. Um, it's important. And it's important to support these authors who have been silenced by the regime by buying the book or talking about them and just sharing what we've learned from them. So I'm excited to read this, although I'm a little trepidatious as well. It's going to be kind of, kind of uh, frustrating, I'm sure, and upsetting. March 7th, guys. Okay. What else do I show you? Well, this came in the mail just a couple days ago. The good folks at uh, John Hopkins Press sent me this book. Um, I was not expecting it, so thank you so much. Uh, I'm looking forward to reading this. Um, wow, this is different. This is Land and Liberty, Henry George and the Crafting of Modern Liberalism by Christopher William England. Can you see that? Again, put out by Johns Hopkins Press. Hopkins Press. What is this about? Well, let's learn together, shall we? In 912, 912. <laughs> in 1912, Sun Yat-sen announced the birth of the Chinese Republic and promised that it would be devoted to the economic welfare of all its people. In shaping his plans for wealth re redistribution, he looked to an American now largely forgotten in the U.S., Henry George. In Land and Liberty, Christopher William England excavates the lost history of one of America's most influential radicals and explains why so many activists were once inspired by his proposal to tax landed wealth. Drawing on the private papers of a network of devoted believers, Land and Liberty represents the first comprehensive account of this important movement to nationalize land and expropriate rent. Beginning with concerns about rising rents in the 1870s and ending with the establishment of New Deal policies that extended public control over land, natural res resources, and housing, Georgism, that's in quotes, served as a catalyst for reforms intended to make the nation more democratic. Many of these concerns remain relevant today, including the exploitation of natural resources, rising urban rent, and wealth inequality. There will always be wealth inequality <laughs> if you live in a capitalist society. You don't want to live in a socialist society. You don't want to live in a communist society. Not everyone is meant, is not meant, it's just life is unfair. <laughs> we all make different amounts of money, and that's the way it always will be. That's just my take on it. You're never going to equalize wealth. You're just never. Anyway, uh, at a time when class division sparked fears that capitalism and democracy were incompatible, hopes of building a social welfare state using the rents of idle landlords revitalized the middle class's conviction that democracy and liberty could be reconciled. Against steep odds, George made land nationalization vital to the politics of a nation dominated by small farmers and helped push liberalism leftward through his calls for collective rights to land and natural resources. So this book came out on Valentine's Day, so I'm just now getting a copy of this, but thank you so much. And I'm intrigued by the premise, although I probably, would, probably will take some, uh, some different opinions and stances on this one. Um, as I said, I'm not into uh, nationalizing industries and collectivizing, but that's just me. But check it out, Land and Liberty. I've never heard of Henry George, so this is going to be an education. So, brand new from John Hopkins University Press. What else we got here? This is an interesting book. I can't wait. I know I say this about a lot of the books I get, but I really, there's just so much to read and learn. I just, I get, get so excited. Okay. The publisher here is Greenleaf Book, or Greenleaf Press. I've gotten a couple of their books before. This is Under the Naga Tale. A true story of survival, bravery, and escape from the Cambodian genocide by Mai Bunsung Tang with James Tang. This is put out by Greenleaf Book Group Press. It's a beautiful cover, too. Ah. <sighs> From, forced from his home by the Khmer Rouge, teenager Mai Tang 
struggles to endure years of backbreaking work, constant starvation, um, and ruthless cruelty from his captors, supposed freedom fighters who turned against their own people. Mai risks torture and death to escape into the dark tropical jungles, trekking across a relentless wilderness, crawling with soldiers. When Mai is able to overcome unthinkable odds in the hopes of reuniting with his family, fate takes a cruel turn as he flees war-torn Cambodia. He becomes trapped as a refugee with thousands of others on the ancient temple mountain, Preya Vihir, a place surrounded by countless deadly landmines. Caught up in the terror once more, it is only his willpower to survive, and dreams of a better country that give Mai the, the dreams... Oh, I just read that again. Uh, the dreams of a better country that give Mai the strength to face the dangers ahead. Um, so this sounds like a fantastic survival story. Or a fascinating read. Not a fascinating survival. I'm sure it was not fascinating for him as he was going through it. Um, got lots of pictures in the inset. Um, on the insert and the inside, I mean, again, love memoirs and people overcoming incomprehensible odds is always something very compelling to me. So, I look forward to reading this. Greenleaf Books, thank you. Okay, guys. Now these are books, this is a book I got a little bit ago, it's, it's, it's relatively new. Oh, this, okay. You know what, I'll save this for another, I'll save this for a Civil War. Um, I think it's about time I make another Civil War book um, kind of roundup. Books that I have on my shelf, books I've read, books I want to read. I think what the, my, my Civil War book, book tag or my, whatever, I did a Civil War book, uh, video and that's like one of my most popular videos ever. <laughs> the, the views on that one are crazy. Um, let's go into these. I got a couple more books from the beautiful folks at the University of Nebraska Press, which I recently just featured um, in some of their new books that came out at the end of last year and uh, are coming out now. Um, but I got a couple more that came in, like this one. Uh, this is an imprint, an imprint of University of Nebraska Press, Bison Books, and this is Sitting Bull and the Paradox of L Lakota Nationhood. Look at this. Little volume. So what is this guy about? What? Let me just do that. Okay. In this newly revised biography, Sitting Bull and the Paradox of Lakota Nationhood, Gary C. Anderson offers a new interpretation of Sitting Bull's conflict with General George Custer at Little Bighorn, and its aftermath, and details the events and life experiences that ultimately led Sitting Bull into battle. Incorporating the latest scholarship, Anderson profiles this military and spiritual leader of the Lakota people, a man who re remained a staunch defender of his nation and way of life until his untimely death. So, um, an updated, revised version. I'm happy to um, get a new afterword by Gary C. Anderson. Um, but, you know, I love reading about... The, the West, Old West history, was one of the, my uh, entryways into just the, war, the larger world of United States history and then global history. Um, so this was where I cut my teeth as a youngster, was on just loving stories of the Old West and the Native Americans. So I'm going back to my roots with this book. Uh, it's going to have a nice warm place in my heart here. So this is one is out now. Actually, yes, it just came out um, on March 1st, so two days ago, you guys. This is available now, if you would like to order it from your library. Okay, another book that is very quite different. It also came out on March 1st. This is a Nebraska Press title. This is the, in let me get this, this is the Indigenous Paleolithic of the Western Hemisphere by Paulette F.C. Steves. The Indigenous Paleolithic of the Western Hemisphere. What could this be about? It says here, this book is a reclaimed history of the deep past of indigenous people in North and South America during the Paleolithic. Okay. 
Um, Steve's mines evidence from archaeology sites and pale Paleolithic environments, landscapes in mammalian and human migrations to make the case that people have been in the Western Hemisphere not only just prior to Clovis sites, which was 10,200 years ago, but for more than 60,000 years and likely more than 100,000 years. Steves discusses the political history of American anthropology to focus on why pre-Clovis sites have been dismissed by the field for nearly a century. She explores supporting evidence from genetics and linguistic anthropology regarding First Peoples and time frames of early migrations. Additionally, she highlights the work and struggles faced by a small yet vibrant group of American and European archaeologists who have ex excavated and reported on numerous pre-Clovis archaeology sites. So, if you're a big fan of, like, archaeology, obviously, um, anthropology, oh, prehistory, right? We're going into the Paleo Paleolithic. Holy crap! There is some... There is some metadata right there, baby. Um... Oh, this is going to be good. I might I might not understand all of it, but I'm going to give it a go. <laughs> um, fascinating. And this this was a um this book was the just Oh, I see cuz it's coming out in paperback. So it did come out in hardcover, so, but it was the 2022 Choice Outstanding Academic Title. So I'm getting the, we're getting the, the access to the more affordable paperback out there. Um, so if you're interested, check this out. Indi Indigenous Paleolithic of the Western Hemisphere. Oh, great. Now, another um, imprint of the Nebraska Press line is Potomac Books. Big fan of Potomac Books. And I, this is about someone I never even knew about and during the Civil War. This is called Delivered Under Fire. Absalom, let me get this in there, Absalom Markland in Freedom's Mail by Candace Shy Hooper. So, what do we have here? Who, could, who is this about? Let's read it. Here we go. Got my pub sheet. We're ready to go. During the Civil War, his movements from battlefield to battlefield were followed in the North and in the South nearly as closely as those of generals, though he was not in the military. After the war, his swift response to Ku Klux Klan violence sparked passage of a landmark civil rights law, though he was not a politician. When he died in 1888, newspapers reported his death from coast to coast, yet he's unknown today. This, this is good, uh, I'm just saying little inside baseball stuff, but this is this is good uh, marketing copy. This is really well written. He was the man who delivered the most valuable ingredient in U.S. soldiers' fighting spirit during those terrible war years. Letters between the front lines and the home front. He was Absalom Markland, special agent of the United States Post Office. And this is his first biography. Isn't this fascinating? Oh, it goes into a great more detail on what he did, um, but you know, he carried the messages, and let's let's take a look. Let's get a picture of this guy. I got a nice finished copy here. This is a good, this is a, this is the man right here. That is Absalom Markland, special agent of the U United States Post Office. Isn't that something else? So this, um, when did this come out? Also March 1st? Or no? This came out just on one name. You can request it. You can find it wherever fine books are sold. But this is, uh, Delivered Under Fire, Absalom Markland and Freedom's Mail by Candace Shai Hooper, Potomac Books. Guys, we're almost at 40 minutes. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes. I got a final copy. I think I've, sh I've shown this book before on this channel, but I'll show it again. This is currently out. Um, this is uh, this is out right now that you guys can pick up. A Mystery of Mysteries. The Death and Life of Edgar Allan Poe. This is by St. Martin's Press. This is by Mark Davidziak. Um, I think I have shown like a review, a review copy of this, but this did finally come out. Uh, this was back on Valentine's Day, but um, this is out in final right now. Just wanted to show you guys. I know I've covered this on this channel. Um, 
a couple of others I've gotten some copies on. I do have a, um, I have a hardcover of this book. They've sent me, they were so kind to send out a soft cover. I'm going to try to do more giveaways, and I tell you guys I'm going to start using like a random generator. There's a way you can put things in, and um, YouTube will pick out a winner for you randomly, so you're not trying to figure out a, you know, I'm picking a number through one through five, whoever guesses, you know, I'm not doing that. So we're going to use a random generator, but uh, if anyone has made it this long in this video, you are rewarded by the opportunity to have a soft cover copy, if you're interested. Of We Don't Know Ourselves by Fenton O'Toole, A Personal History of Modern Ireland. Um, this came out last year, um, and um, it's now in paperback. This came out in paperback on February 7th. I have the hardcover on my shelf behind me here. And uh, so, yeah, this is put up by Liverwright, or Liverwright, a imprint of Norton, W.W. W. Norton. And I wanted to share this because this was sent to me, uh, or they asked if I would like to have a copy of this. This came out the last year, and for some reason I'm only getting it now, um, but I'm looking forward to it. It's the soft cover of Robert Hardman's Queen of Our Times, a massive study, or biography, on, you know, may she rest in peace, Queen Elizabeth II. This is the commemorative edition. So, uh, but nice big chunkster, um, and this is the, yeah, I got a nice final copy of this, and I think this is where I'm going to go as far as, I'm going to start with this one when it comes to Queen Elizabeth II biographies, the second. So, if you have any recommendations, please share them below, but um, yeah, this is put out by Pegasus, nice big beefy biography for the dear departed queen. And that, my friends, <laughs> should wrap up this version of New History on the Horizon. I hope you've enjoyed it and you found some new things to tickle your fancy and to keep an eye out for. Um, as always, I'm happy to hear what interests you in the comments below. Uh, you guys really make my day. I love hearing from you. And um, hey, until next time, keep the wallet open because <laughs> you're going to be buying more books if you're watching my channel. <laughs> Uh, okay, but have a great weekend, everybody, and we'll talk to you soon.